Wow. Okay, well, that escalated quickly, didn't it? So, uh, this is going to be a bit of a hot take, guys, and I'm still trying to process the information. Obviously, this is a developing story, so just bear with me as I try to figure out what the hell is going on here. I got some notes. Now, first, we need to provide some context. If you're ever trying to understand a, a big flash bulb event like this, then you have to understand the context first if you're trying to decipher what exactly happened because of course the fog of war is so thick the kremlin's taken over the crime scene so whatever they say is what we're going to be left with at the end of the day if you don't know what i'm talking about evgeny Prigozhin, the head of the wagner organization has been confirmed to have been assassinated okay this was clearly an assassination this kind of thing doesn't happen plane crashes almost never happen they certainly don't happen when you have the top brass of the largest private contracting organization involved in high intensity warfare in what many people think is the beginning of World War III, uh, that, that doesn't happen. This was an assassination. The question is, was it the Ukrainians or elements that are aligned with NATO or was it the Russians? Now on its face, obviously everybody's gonna say, oh yeah, this guy attempted a coup. So clearly Putin waited a while, waited till things dissipated, wait, waited until uh, Wagner was disbanded and somewhat integrated into the Russian military in Belarus and Ukraine and Russia. And then, of course, he took him out. In fact, some people made this exact prediction. Good on them. But nothing is so cut and dry. Now, it's important to understand the context, though, if you really want to get a sense for what's going on. Just 48 hours ago, General Surovikin was confirmed to have been relieved of his duties by the Russian government. This is a guy who's been missing since the coup. Okay, now remember, when the coup happened, General Surovikin made a camera appearance where he's holding a rifle and he's threatening Evgeny Prigozhin that he needs to stand down Okay, and at that time, I thought, oh, he's trying to clearly send a message. These guys aren't aligned at all. But was this just a show? We don't know what kind of soap opera is going on behind the scenes. Anyways, he goes missing after there are rumors that there was collusion between Evgeny Prigozhin and Surovikin. And then Surovikin goes missing. He's on house arrest. He now has been relieved of his duties, apparently. And then just one day later... The entire leadership of Wagner is taken out in what must have been a bomb on the plane or some act of sabotage. Because think about it. The Russians right now, they don't want to take credit for this. In fact, the Kremlin is already calling this a Ukrainian terrorist attack. Okay, So they don't want to take credit for this. And so they wouldn't have risked shooting it down with a missile, I don't think, because they obviously somebody would have gotten that on tape. And then, you know, the only people who have the capability to do that in and around Moscow are going to be obviously the Russians, right? Um, they might have been able to make the case that it was Ukrainian drone that flew into the plane or something. But why would you risk that? If, if it was the Kremlin, it was a bomb. There was no way in hell that this was just an accident. This was not a fluke. This clearly was an assassination. It was a hit job. Now, if it was the Ukrainians, you got to expect a massive, massive response. If what the FSB, which is the, uh, the Russian, uh, kind of like the FBI, if you will, if, if it's true that the Ukrainians are the ones who did this, we can expect a massive response. Now, let me get back to the, the context of all of this, okay? Earlier in the month, the Ukrainians made this propaganda video that showed drones going into Moscow. They were telegraphing that something big was going to happen around August 24th. And lo and behold, it's August 24th right now in Ukraine. In the days running up to this, we've seen attacks on Moscow every single night to the point as where I talked about yesterday, the Russian government is now going to be making it illegal to film these attacks because they want to control the narrative. They realize it's only going to escalate. They don't want to spook the population. And of course, they want to save face. So they want to prohibit, just like they do in Ukraine, the filming of these for national security purposes, they're going to say. So all of this is happening at the same time. Okay, so you have this prediction by 
the Ukrainian Air Force with their propaganda video that something's coming on the 24th. You have Budinov, the, uh, the head of the Ukrainian intelligence, saying that uh, something big is about to happen in the next couple days. There's another incident that he was probably referring to that happened today as well. Russia took a big hit today, uh, if you believe that Evgeny Prigozhin was an asset and not a liability, that is. Also, the UK was just getting ready to proscribe the Wagner Group as a terrorist organization within weeks as part of a fresh crackdown on the Russian mercenary network, according to British government insiders. Now, whether the Brits did this is kind of a moot point. It's kind of irrelevant considering many other countries like France have already designated Wagner a terrorist organization. But could have this been one way to just get rid of Wagner altogether, rebuild it, rebrand it, disband it, integrate it, consolidate it into the Russian military? You know, Putin got his use out of it. But it's time to go, basically. It, this could have just been one more reason. Because this would have put them on the same level as Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and Hezbollah. So yes, we all know that the West and NATO don't like uh, the Wagner organization. But to put them on that level as you know the same people who are allegedly did 9-11, then uh, that's pretty substantial. And that's possibly the attention that Putin doesn't want, even though he's already wanted by the ICC. Anyways... So if no matter how this war goes, uh, they, they have his number. So the other thing that happened today was a S-400 system. I don't think the launchers, but I think the brain of the system was destroyed in Crimea. Now, this is big because this is supposed to be Russia's most advanced system, uh, save the uh, S-500 and S-550 systems, okay? So that the Ukrainians were able to take this out, presumably with one missile, because I, I don't see, not hearing a lot of talk about decoys, or uh, obviously they must have used a scout missile, perhaps they used some kind of, um, it's got a call coming in here, perhaps they used a uh, storm shadow missile, who knows, either way they were able to get through the S-400 defense, unless this was a work of sabotage from the ground up. It's hard to say. Either way, Budinov called this one. And now why this is so substantial is because the Russians have a lot of S-400s. That's not the problem. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, you know, it, it's a big loss. Uh, we don't want to uh, understate it. But in recent days, just yesterday, in fact, the Russian Air Force chased away two reconnaissance planes in the Black Sea. Now, these Black Sea reconnaissance planes frequent the, the Black Sea a lot. And uh, it's not the first time that one has been either chased away or brought down with the fuel dump that we seen last year. But this is going to basically put the Russians in a predicament of they're going to have to make sure that these recon planes get no space and uh, have no uh, ability to conduct operations in the Black Sea meaning that they're either going to have to be shot down or traced or chased out as soon as they show up on the radar. Because, and even if they are in international waters, that's where it's going to get hairy because these uh, RQ Global Hawks or whatever they are, uh, Reaper drones or whatever they are, they, uh, Barakters from Turkey, they are surveying the area and then they're relaying that information to Ukraine who is then using it to attack these targets. So the Russians are going to be left with no choice. So all this is happening while this is happening. It's not a good day for Russia. Okay. And in addition to that, Erdogan today, the Turkish leader, reiterated that Crimea is part of Ukraine. So the guy who is supposed to be like the two-faced backstabbing friend of Vladimir Putin, who always backstabs Putin, but it, you know, Putin is trying to work with them and people are saying he's kind of on the fence. Well, he backstabbed them once again. He basically said, we maintain our support for the territorial integrity of Ukraine and that Crimea is a part of Ukraine. So while all this is going on, Putin is giving a speech commemorating the Battle of Kursk and a new monument that was erected to commemorate this. And he did not look dissatisfied, okay? He did not look uh, frustrated. Perhaps he wasn't uh, made aware of what has happened just yet uh, when he was giving that speech, but he didn't look too bothered. 
So a lot of people are saying, oh, that's evidence that he knew and that he's happy that Prigozhin is gone. But I don't, I'm not entirely sold on that because you need to understand there's two narratives developing here, okay? So the, the pro-Wagner crowd on Telegram is basically saying that they're now about to march to Moscow once again. With what leadership after this massive decapitation strike, I couldn't tell you. But I uh, translated a message that they left on their Telegram channel and they basically said, now there are rumors about the death of Evgeny Prigozhin. Those have been confirmed. We are directly saying that suspect of attempted murder, this is a bad translation, guys, so bear with me, Kremlin officials led by Putin, if there is information about the death of Prigozhin, confirm ourselves, we organize the second march of justice to Moscow. So they're pinning this on Putin. That's the difference. In the past, Prigozhin never singled out Putin. He always attributed this to the Russian defense ministry, Sergei Shoigu and Gorismov and uh, a few others. He never pointed the finger at Putin per se. So they're pointing it at Putin, which makes you wonder, are there certain elements with the Wagner group that are colluding with the partisans, the uh, Ukrainian saboteurs, NATO in effect, uh, interesting stuff. Now, some people are saying, oh, this is just pseudocide. You know, this is just uh, him faking his own death. Pseudocide, right? And that he's done this or attempted to do this in the past or he's been presumed dead before and maybe he's not dead because there was rumors about a second plane that took off at the same time. There was two planes. I'm not sure who survived of the Wagner top brass on that second plane, but apparently one of the planes was blown up in the mid middle of the sky. This wasn't just, oh, it crashed because it, you know, you can see it obviously blew up in the sky. Witnesses said they heard explosions and the thing went straight down. So the other plane apparently turned around and landed in Moscow. So, uh, you know, some people are suspecting, oh, this was a body double and, you know, it's pseudocide. Well, I guess we'll never know. Uh, bodies were too burnt to identify at first, but then the Kremlin came on the scene and uh, they took over the crime scene, okay? Now, this is important. The Russian Federal Security Service has reportedly taken over the investigation of the aircraft, air crash, which appears to have caused the death of Evgeny Prigozhin, the PMC leader. The FSB is considering this as a terrorist attack. So the Kremlin is already going to use this to ramp up support for the war. They're going to try to use this to their advantage they're going to pretend like, we, we didn't know, we, this is bad, this is terrible, this is horrible. I guess we're going to see what Putin says, because that's what it's going to come down to. Uh, if Putin comes out and gives some compelling speech about how we must prevent these sorts of attacks on our soil, I guess we're going to have to assess and scrutinize and determine how sincere that comes across. But he's going to have to do something like that, otherwise... There was a, a pretty big cult following with Wagner. They were kind of like, uh, I don't know, like they, they almost had that rock star appeal, the bad boy sort of appeal for a lot of the youth, not only in Russia, but just for people throughout Europe who support the Russian narrative. So killing him could effectively make him a martyr, which would create civil unrest inside of Russia. According to Russian Z blogger Markov, the assassination of Prigozhin and Utkin, who was the founder, one of the founders of the Wagner organization, who was then demoted to deputy. And it's important to note, too, that uh, Prigozhin didn't perform any military leadership duties. He was like the spokesperson for the organization. So as much as this is a, I'm sure there was some actual um, top military guys on this plane, but as much as this is, seems like a blow to Wagner's military capability, it probably isn't because they just lost their spokesman and his deputy and probably a few others. Uh, so the chain of command has been shaken up a little bit, but their military cap capacity, I would presume, remains the same. Anyways, he says the assassination of Prigozhin and Utkin, the creators of Wagner, is undoubtedly a Ukrainian terrorist attack for Ukraine's U Independence Day tomorrow. So you see, people are going to say, well, what, you know, Ukraine timed this, that this was all time to, you know, to, to correspond with 
the uh, ceremonies that are going to be taking place tomorrow and the prediction that they were going to do this. So that would be a very calculated uh, clandestine operation if it was true that the Russians did this on that day so that they could pin it on the Ukrainians who were saying that they were going to do something around this day. That was a government-funded propaganda video that said on August 24th, you're going to feel the wrath of Ukraine. Now, we must also understand that the Ukrainians cannot be happy with Wagner for what happened in Bakhmut. How many people died at the hands of Wagner? It seems, it, it seems feasible both ways that uh, it would be very hard for Ukraine, even pro-Ukraine accounts, to get behind an organization that brought so much misery upon Ukrainian's people, even if they happen to be an enemy of Vladimir Putin. So it's very, you know, there, it's you could justify both positions. You could say, yeah, this clearly was Vladimir Putin assassinating him for what he did, and this is what a lot of people expected. But... You could also say that you, there's a lot of Ukrainians that didn't like this guy, obviously, okay? And that nothing he, he could have done, he could have never redeemed himself by, you know, by uh, uh, going against Putin. In fact, he has always been an advocate for a more aggressive approach. He wanted to use nukes at the beginning of the war. So this guy was no friend of Ukraine, so indeed, the Russians could make a compelling case that this indeed was an act of Ukrainian sabotage. And whether that's true or not, they will use it towards the end of increasing support for the conflict and justifying escalating the conflict. So if it was the case that this was the Ukrainians and that this blindsided the Russians, you can expect a massive response. It's going to be calculated, but it's going to be a massive escalation. If the Russians themselves did it and are still just going to pretend that it sucks and, you know, use it to sort of rally support for the war, you'll see a response, but it won't be as significant. Okay. Now there is this rumor that, um, Wagner is trying to leave Belarus. This is totally unconfirmed. There was concerns that a Russian IL-76 transport plane landed in a town that I cannot pronounce, Machulishi, Mash, Ma, Makulishi, Makulishi, airfield in Belarus could be used to evacuate Wagner members. This was later debunked uh, by Belarusian media, saying that this does not correspond to reality and the aircraft's arrival is unrelated to the events in the Tver region. So crazy, crazy stuff going on. And uh, right now, as we speak, North Korea just did their satellite launch. If I'm not mistaken, that was just before I started making this video. I, I got uh, word from Telegram that um, the North Koreans launched a satellite and that the Japanese had descended into their bunkers in the Okinawa prefecture. But the I think the alarm had been uh, had been uh, removed and uh, the drill, uh, the, the alarm was lifted after it was determined that it was not an act of aggression. This happened just after the South Koreans did their civil defense drill. So it was well timed to that. So the South Koreans did their nuclear defense drill. Fortunately, the North Koreans didn't interpret this as inoffensive, but they did enough that they launched that satellite or ICBM or whatever it was today. So things are getting absolutely crazy, guys. Just day by day, it gets more and more insane. You, I mean, imagine the movie that they're going to be able to make out of this when all the smoke clears. My goodness. My goodness. I'm not sure if I'm going to be doing another daily update video today, but we'll see. Uh, the situation is developing so rapidly that who knows what's going to happen next. Just uh, keep your head on a swivel. Watch your six. Thanks for watching Canadian Preparation.